Good morning. Uh, today we're going to talk about goats. Turn with me to Matthew 25. Last week we talked about individuals, then with Ezekiel. Today we're going to talk about God's wrath on sin. Now, take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 25, which we just touched on last week, Matthew 25, and look at verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Verse 32 of Matthew 25. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from the no another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left hand. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior. We thank you that we will be saved through the wrath, from the wrath through him. In the Lord's name we pray. Now, now sheep have a characteristic, um, they will follow. What was David doing? He was a herder of the sheep. And why did they have herders? Well, if a, uh, a lion or another predator came, he would protect them. And what's the, what's the famous passage of our Lord? The sheep hear my voice. They're good followers. But what, what it is about goats? Now, when he says this left hand and this right hand, we looked at Genesis 20. Genesis 12, 3, which says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them which curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That Abraham a covenant about God. Now we're studying the book of Obadiah, and, and we looked at Romans 9, 13, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, which is quoting Malachi 1, verses 1 and 2. And we're studying why he cursed Esau, why he didn't like Esau, Esau, why he hated him. And we're finding out it's because he didn't, he didn't, even though God gave him land, God said you would be a warrior, he refused to bless Jacob and his descendants. Look at Matthew um, 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And it goes on, it says, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came upon me. Blessing Jacob. Because before it talked about separating the nations. Now he's talking about the sheep on his right hand. Come to me and this is what, what, what you did. Look at verse 41. Th then shall he, he say also upon them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, the go goats were on the left hand. The uh, sheep were on the right hand. Now, what is it about goats? And I ran, every time goats is used in the Bible, and I came to the conclusion, they're, they're like cats, only they, can't, they, they, they are more stubborn than cats, if you can imagine that, is, is what, just reading the verses, because I'm from the, what, city, grew up in the city, was raised in the city. Don't know too much about goats. And, and so I, I looked out there and I found this article that discussed goats. I, I've been, haven't been around goats. My first memory of goats was the cartoons. What happens? You bend over to tie your shoes and what happens to the billy goat? And what does he eat out of? Cans. Yeah. So, God uses goats to symbolize evil in numerous instances in the Bible. In Zechariah 10.3, he says he will punish the goats. We just read Matthew 25.31-36. to 36. He returns in judging the nations. He, uh, we read verse 33. He, Christ, will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. 
The sheep are then given eternal life, but the goats are cast into the lake of fire. So it should be clear from this section of scripture that we want the attributes of the sheep, not the goats. Yeah, want to be thought of as a sheep. We're humans. You know, goats are capricious. They are impulsive and unpredictable, devious and contrary. When they are grazing, it is not unusual to see several with their heads through the fence, stretching to reach the grass that is always greener on the other side. Folklore says that goats have slits in their eyes to enable them to see around corners where the grazing is better. And their, their eyes are creepy. They have a little black, their pupils are straight line. If they are not poking their heads through the fences, they may be standing on their hind legs, stretching for those tender leaves just out of reach. Goats are never content with what they have. Good characteristic of an unsaved person. There are uh, goats are experts in opening gates and squeezing through small gaps because they hate to be confined. Fences that will handle sheep, cattle, and horses will not hold goats. They will work tirelessly to spring themselves from any situation they deem inhibiting. <laughs> Consequently, goats are not very good followers. They don't hear his voice. Meat packers use the instinctive instinct in sheep with the ability to be herded in goats to their advantage. They will train an old goat. What what what, what do you, sometimes you hear an old man called? That old goat, right? That old stubborn goat. So it says meat packers, they will train an old goat appropriately called Judas. They call it the Judas goat to lead sheep to the pens for the slaughter. A well-trained Judas goat will lead group after group of sheep to the slaughter all day long. Goats also possess a stubborn streak. A friend of mine moved a goat into a certain direction. He grabbed it by the horns and pushed and pulled and tugged. No matter how or in what direction he tried to move the goat, it resisted. He would not budge, not one inch. Then he let it go. It trotted off in the direction he wanted to go in the first place. <laughs> it's, uh, but, but the characteristics of Christ says, be ye followers of me? No. And you'll resist and tug. And, and it fits. It fits these description of these, these animals. Um, a friend grew up on a farm and has a long experience with goats. As a youth, he and his mother and sister more or less turned some goats into pets. Once after a big noon meal, his mother took the kids down the road to their grandfather's house. Knowing they would not be gone very long, his mother decided not to clear the table. Mistake number one. When they returned home, though, they found the biggest of the goats standing right in the middle of the table. <laughs> Amidst all the dishes and leftovers, the screen door had been no match for Billy. <laughs> well, another night, they went to the back bedroom. Moments later, the family heard screaming, someone's in there. The father grabbed his gun and went to confront the intruder. Instead of a burglar, he found the same goat in bed under the covers, only his slitty eyes peering out. And that, that's... That, that's, that's a characteristic of a goat. So we read in Matthew 25, in the future, he's going to take all the nations and he's going to separate them, right hand, left hand, sheep, goats. Now let's look at that again in Jeremiah 25. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 25. If you want to see how God's going to judge the nation, this is a good Cliff Notes chapter. There's plenty of other places we could go. Please turn again to Jeremiah 25, and please look at verse 
Uh, 15 is what I want. Jeremiah 25, 15. It says, For thus said the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury of my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink in it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send upon them. Then I took the cup of the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. To wit, and then he says an interesting word here in 18. Verse 18, what's the next word? Jerusalem. Where does the wrath of God start? Jerusalem. And the cities of Judea, and the kings thereof, and the princes thereof, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, and hissing, and a curse, as it is this day. And Jerusalem, that, that's a very important fact. Where does the wrath of God begin? Jerusalem. Um, in First Peter 4.17, Peter says, For the time is come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it's first begun at us, Peter, the little flock, Sadducees and Pharisees, generation of vipers still sitting on the throne, or the Antichrist, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? So he says, we're going to get our due, nation Israel, because how we dissipate God. Woe is to the nations that curse them. And, and that's, that's, that's what he's talking about. The big point I'm making is, where does he begin? Jerusalem. And then in verse 19, he picks up with the nations. Like uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his servants, and the princes of all his people, and all the mingled people, and all the kings of the land of Uz. Who's from the land of Uz? Job. Job. So we can't know where Job was from. Yes, we can. And all the kings of the land of the Philistines and Ashkelon and Azon and Ekon and the remnant of Ashdod and Edom. Edom, that's what we're dis discussing with um, Obadiah and Moab and the children of Ammon. And it, it goes down the list. And then he picks it up in verse 29. Look at this again. For lo, I begin to bring evil. And we've studied that word evil. When you're getting punished, it's evil to who? You. It's just punishment, but in your eyes, it's what? Evil. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. We identified that city up in verse... Um, 18, to wit, Jerusalem. Again, my point is, this wrath starts with Jerusalem. For lo, I bring evil on the city which is called my name, and shall be utterly unpunished. Ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for the sword upon all the inhabitants of earth, says the Lord of hosts. What's the word of that? Armageddon. Um... Let me read to you Revelations 14. And another angel, I'm reading verse 18 to 20. And another angel came from out the altar which had the power over fire and cried with a loud voice of him that had a sharp sickle. Now remember we read about the sword. Here it's called a shickle, sickle, because he's harvesting the nations to put them on his left hand or on his right hand. Thrust in thy sickle, then who's doing this? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Thrust in thy sickle and gather the clusters of vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angels thrust in the sickle into the earth, and he gathered the vines of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Ooh. And the wine press was trodden without the city. And the blood came out of the wine press, even under the horse bridles, in a space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. One commentary said that's like a lake of blood, two hundred by two hundred miles long. 
the wrath of God in that great and horrible day. And where does it begin? If you've been paying attention this morning, where does he start? Jerusalem, his nation, then Judah. And, oh, why is that important? Let's go over to Matthew, where you just were. Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. And get Luke chapter 3. And we're going to talk a little bit about the warning of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 7. And this is John the Baptist. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism... He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the what? What wrath is that? What we just read about in Jeremiah. The wrath to come. It, it's John 3, 7. And if you look at Luke 3, 7, it's, it's, it's the same passage except the people are different in Luke 3 7 it says then said he to the multitude the multitude not just the Sadducees and Pharisees then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come that horrible wrath of the God on the nations separating the nations the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. Why is that important? Flip with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And look at verse 9. And he starts out with what word? Much more. Then be now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from what? From the wrath through him. That's a wrath on sin. That's being part of a goat nation down into the the depths of hell forever. Now, they said the, the um, first book Paul penned was First Thessalonians. First book. They say it's the oldest, the first one he tends. He doesn't get to verse verse eleven before he talks about this wrath. Look look at First Thessalonians chapter one. Ephesians, Philippians. First Thessalonians chapter one. And it says, and to wait for his son from heaven. He said that's first fruits. Who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. So what's that mean? Before he starts his wrath in upon Jerusalem, Judea, he's going to take his church up and out. That's wh wh why we read this. It's fascinating that we're, uh, lost people are one heartbeat away from being in hell, and the only thing that stands between us and hell is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And to wait for a son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered, past tense, it's a done deal. Church, the body of Christ is not a nation. Mystery program, saved from the wrath to come. So it, 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 it's, it's fascinating because what, what, when we... Learn about how Israel fell and Babylon came up, and they said, "Well, we got a Bible, and we know we're supposed to do this." Nations were listening to God. 
in Obadiah, he raised an ambassador, go up, it says in Obadiah, rise up and attack Edom. Nations listen to God. So um, it, it's important for the nations to know those that believe in God that were not a part of Israel, that this wrath timetable is due. And Paul says, we are saved from the wrath to come by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and being part of the church, the body of Christ. It all fits of why it's here, and it's so important. And it, for us, we, we can read the Old Testament and shiver and look at Revelations and just be thankful we are saved from that wrath to come. So, let, let's go to Ob, o, Obadiah. I have that memorized. It's on page 941. I got my next Bible in a, in a box. And it won't be on page 941. <laughs> Now, our battle today, Paul says, is we don't battle against flesh and blood. In Obadiah, it says, in verse 1, it says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ isn't doing this battle like we read in Jeremiah. We took a little side note. This is God imploring nations to rise up against Edom because of the evil Edom did to his chosen people, Israel. And it says in verse 2, Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Verse 3, The pride of thine heart has deceived thee, Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that had said in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Where was Edom? Not in the grassy fields of milk and honey like he gave Israel. It was in the mountains. And I remember my little um, experience in Korea, real appreciation for that war. It was a defender's paradise. And when the uh, North conquered the South, to take that back was no small feat. Nothing's worse than having bullets rain down on you except the wrath of God. <laughs> it is a, my point is, it's easy to defend high places. It's hard to attack up. We might be all speaking, uh, I wish I was in Dixie at Gettysburg, if Lee, who wanted to take the high ground, did not. But he was... So arrogant that the, uh, he let he let the Union forces take the high ground. He said, "What difference does it make? We're superior," and it didn't happen. It did not happen. And this is it. You're in the mountains. We sing that song. He hideth my soul in the clefts of the rock. Uh, I might want to think rethink that song because the evil people are in the clefts of the rock, and he's going to shake them right out. And it says in verse 3, The pride of thy heart has deceived thee. Um, what's Proverbs 29.2 say? When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth the rule, the people mourn. Righteous king, people happy. Unrighteous king, people miserable. Right? So, an unrighteous king is ruling Edom, they're attacking Israel, and he's going to use other nations to attack them. Again, the pride of thy heart has deceived me. They're in the clefts of the rocks. It's a defensive paradise. You're not coming up here. I'm going to soar with the eagles. It says, Thou that dwelleth in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that said in his heart, Who shall I bring me, who shall bring me down to the ground? Come on up. You're not bringing me down. In Proverbs 16, 18, we always cut that verse short. I did it. 
I wasn't going to print it out like I did last week. I was, Jill said, you're looking for, what was it, Hebrews 9.27, the judgment of God. But it, uh, Proverbs 16.18, we always, pride go up before the fall. It's really not what the verse says. Joyce just shook her head, no, 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 that's not that verse. <laughs> pride goeth before destruction. And the haughty spirit before the hall, the fall. Don't you read that right here in Obadiah? The pride of thy heart has deceived me. You think you can't be brought down low? We'll see about that. Pride. Every person, every nation. T today, I don't need God. And there's little pockets of us that says, yes, you do. We are your ambassadors. We are not a flesh upon flesh warfare. We're ambassadors saying, you do need God. He gave me breath and life, and I don't need him anymore. That's what people think. Oh, yes, you do. We are squatters. Um, for you movie buffs, um, Indiana Jones, remember that, that? That that is where this was supposed to be portrayed, where they found the... Uh, that has nothing to do with the Bible. The Ark of the Covenant and, and, and those clefts of the rocks, and they're going up that trail. It was filmed in Hawaii, but that, the map said it was, it was Edom. So uh, next week, we'll continue our studies in Obadiah.